The first step in solving any problem is understanding it. And the problem of sulfur water is hydrogen sulfide dissolved in water. The result is a highly corrosive water that can attack your copper pipes and metallic pipes, your tub sets, your pipe sets, and your sink, your dishwasher, your valves, your solenoid valves, your various pieces around the house, and literally eat your house resulting in leaks, leaks which in turn cause water damage. If you have uh, cellulose eating molds, you can literally have your house dissolve underneath you. It's also annoying. Your house can smell often like flatulence. And the reason it smells like that is because when you open up and expose the water to air, there is a gas exchange there. Hydrogen sulfide escapes, air goes into the water. That's how that works. Now there's two ways you can exchange this gas. You can have water move through air or you can have air move through water. Now when you have water move through air, usually that is a sprayer of some sort and that involves low volumes of water at high pressures. The downside to this is that that usually involves an orifice, an orifice which also is tended to clog. And then it doesn't spray water, and then your production goes down even lower than it would normally be. Also, high pressure pumps tend to decrease their productivity over time. The direction I went was taking a large volume of water and moving gas through it. The most efficient way I could move gas through it was to use something that someone else had already designed for that same purpose, a commercial fishery stone. Now what this is, is this is an aquarium stone essentially, but this is large. This is designed in numbers of CFM capable. I think this is 2 CFM the size of this because my pump, if I remember right, is good for 4 CFM. 2 CFM per stone. I could also have bought one about half that size is good for one CFM and use four of them. So you want to balance the size of your stone to your need. Now I use then to manifold these together, I use Schedule 80 PVC because Schedule 80 is heavier walled and then heavier by nature. I don't want this thing floating up from the bottom of my tank. I want it to stay on the bottom. So if you take something like, say, a threaded cross, come in here and screw into this, screw this into it. Then you make, say, you make a little set of legs and add you a little bit more there to make sure it sets up off the bottom. Bring a trunk line over here, put a T, mirror it on the other side. Then you can expand this to a width of your tank, slide it down there, and as the air bubbles through, it will create a current of water by making the air rise. It will make the tiniest little bubbles. Bubbles so tiny, even Don Ho would be proud. So. The place that the gas exchange occurs is only at the surface of the bubble. A big bubble will not exchange gas much more efficiently than a lot of little bitty baby bubbles because it's only at the surface. True, a big bubble has more surface than a single small bubble, but thousands of little ones will do a much, much better job than one big bubble. Now inside the little house is a pressure switch which runs the lower half, and there is a motor. Now that pump has just recently been changed out. The other one died. It was actually tripping out on high temperature, and I guess it was wearing inside because it wasn't wanting to stay running very long before it tripped out. And it was kicking the breaker, so she was beginning to drag, and when you felt the back end of the motor, it was getting real hot, so I guess the bearing was going out. That is a totally enclosed fan cool motor and the housing itself, the pump itself, is all plastic with a plastic impeller and a stainless steel shaft. And the purpose of that is this pump is good for fresh or salt water. So it ought to be able to be holding up fairly well under my uh, caustic condition that the sulfur water is. Of course, hopefully by the time this one lifts it and pushes it into the house, it's not to caustic but uh, this was my backup pump the other one lasted about three and a half four years before it finally got to give me trouble and if you look back there you'll see two diaphragm pumps those are 
low pressure, high volume. They're four cubic feet a piece, I believe it is. And they're designed to go with the aeration tank over here. Now what's underneath that tarp is a tank. It's about 800 nominal, 1100 tops. And inside there we have some commercial aeration stones, fishing stones. And what they're for is for commercial fisheries to uh, pump air into it. That's what that, that's what those system is. That's a, that's a fishery aeration unit, just like you would have in an aquarium. Except this isn't an aquarium. This is a big plastic poly tank buried in the ground. It's not listed for that purpose, but I have it uh, carefully buried by hand, dug by backhoe, buried by hand. And uh, I'll show you what's inside of it that makes it work in just a second. So what's under the uh, tarps? Well, let's look. First of all, this little guy is two valves back to back. One's in, one's out. That's just so you can't build up any pressure. These are the air hoses coming into them. Basically, they're just uh, uh, watertight conduit fittings with uh, the right size for that particular type of uh, uh, hose to go into it down to the tank. They come in through plastic pipes buried from the little house over there where the pumps are. Flow switches go right here. Let's look under the hatch. Now we have two flow switches. The bottom one is low level. Now these are mercuryless flow switches. The one at the bottom, what it does is it closes down to keep you from sucking all the water out of the tank, keep you from crushing it in because this tank will float when the ground gets soggy and full of water. That one above it is the one that tells the uh, in the well pump we've got enough water shut off. The one down below it is cut it off entirely so that we can't pump it dry. Now, did you see the water boiling? What that is, is that's the aeration stones blowing water out. Now you see we don't have a lot of air going to it because we split a line up here. We gotta do a little repair. And how this is set? Concrete block. Schedule 80 plastic flange. Schedule 80 piece of pipe. Stainless fittings. Mercuryless float switches. And we have a rescue wire right there. Or actually a rope. So it doesn't rot, we'll pull it up. See the hoses? I'll show you a split here. See the little split? We gotta repair that. We'll put that screw back down and we'll be covering it back up with a new tarp. Now you see that little black piece in between the topmost elbow and the tank? That's actually brass. The uh, copper reacts to the hydrogen sulfide gas and turns black. Now if you have copper pipes and you have sulfur water, it will eat holes in it. That's why you plumb your whole house in as much plastic as you possibly can because it will eat steel pipe and brass pipe and ball valves and that sort of thing that's made out of metal up. You have to use stainless. And if you look real close, the camera will show it down there, you see that's loose. That's because the gas through these many years has dissolved the nut that was holding that down. Now I guess that's okay because we keep her tarped up here. The other thing I want to point out, you paint it black and keep it covered in black in as many layers of coverage as you can because you don't want any photoreactive organism, you know, um, algae or something like that growing water. You saw a while ago how clean and clear the water was just like a cave. Now we're going to fix this piece right here and turn the air back on. Now one last thing I want to point out. This little round piece has the same function in it that that thing has. This is just a backup because I don't want the thing to ever collapse or explode. So I want to make sure we had plenty of uh, air ready.